Hello and welcome to the sewing tutorial for the 1871 Stout Corset from Harper's Bazaar. Um, this pattern was originally published in a women's fashion magazine. It was intended for the home sewist um, and probably for someone sewing completely by hand. Um, I have plans to make one by hand and to give you that tutorial as well so that you can see the differences between if you're sewing completely by hand or by machine. Um, but we thought it would be good to make one entirely by machine as well for the modern sewist who's like, I just need a corset and I don't want to spend too much time on it. I just want it fast, I want it strong, and I want it to give me a nice shape and feel comfy. So this is that corset. It's so exciting to be working on a corset that was intended um, for a plus-sized person from the get-go rather than just being like a straight size that's been graded up. Um, so I'm really excited um, in collaboration with Kenna to be able to offer this to you. Um, so without further ado, please enjoy this sewing tutorial. Alright, so I wanted to show you all the assembled materials and pattern really quick. Here's what the pattern looks like. I've tried to lay it out a little bit so you can see where things go. There's the gores, the facings. We've got a busk for the front. I bought four metal bones just for the back on both sides of the grommets, um, but I'm going to use synthetic wheel bone for all the rest of the boning in this corset. You can do as you please. You could use steel for all of it if you like. Um, the cotil that I have is like the normal bell pattern cotil that just comes in like white and black and I dyed it myself along with some Petersham ribbon that's going to be for the edge binding. We've got some lacing for the back. We've got some silk twist for the ends of the channels. We've got, this is called fiber rush. That's what I'm going to use for the cording um, right here at the top of the back channels. Um, the thread that I have is by Aurifil. It's a cotton thread. Um, it's discontinued now, I believe, but it's still pretty easy to find. Um, it's just like a, a cotton thread that's not like weird and wiry like all the quilting cotton threads <laughs> that are made for machines. I don't know. But it's the closest equivalent that I can find to the antique Victorian corsets that I've handled. Um, you can also use silk thread. Let me show you what that looks like real quick. Surprise, we're back. Um, the Tire silk that comes from Japan is beautiful stuff. I was trying to remember um, the specs. This is the 30 weight. It's And it's kind of got the same qualities that I like about this in that it's not too high of a twist, it's not too wiry, it's pretty soft, but it doesn't shed too bad under the machine. Like when you run it through a sewing machine, it looks like the seams on the antique corsets that I've seen. So either one of those will do a great job. Um, I'm not putting lace on the top of this corset this time, but you can if you want. Throw some wool trim on there, make it pretty. Um, but yeah, that's all the materials. So we're going to go ahead and start cutting out all the pieces in the cotil. Um, where we have block channels like this, the original instructions say to use a linen tape. I was not able to source linen tape in anything this wide. And also I could see that becoming a problem really fast where if you like altered your pattern a little bit and you're like, oh, I just want to add an extra bone, all of a sudden you can't use a particular width that you bought. So like for me, um, what I'm going to do is just like measure across the width, add 3 8 inch or 1 centimeter seam allowance on both sides and just cut straight grain strips out of this same fabric um, and just like iron both sides under and that's what we're going to use for the bone channels that go through the middle of the pieces that aren't on a seam. Um, so it's going to be same for this guy right here and this guy right here. Um, but the front and the back already have separate facing pieces provided, so you don't have to cut them again. Um, but yeah, let's get her all cut out. Hello, coming to you from the sewing room. Um, just to tell you really quickly about this project, the grain lines really matter. <laughs> so. Those little arrow lines that I've put on the pattern should be the straight grain. The front is like very slightly on the bias, 
so please do that. The gores as well, the grain is going to control like where the bust stuff gets pushed to, so that does matter. Um, I also wanted to say this is all the scrap I have left <laughs> of the like yard cut that I dyed, so I might change some of the fabric requirements. You might want to get like a yard and a half, especially if you're cutting like straight grain strips to use as edge binding rather than getting Petersham ribbon or like some other thing to bind the edges with. Um, but yeah, let's go on to marking details. Alright, so our first step here is to mark and sew these pleats that go up the front. Um, I'm actually going to do the, I'm going to mark the gores first and then I'll mark the pleats because of how I'm going to mark them and I'll show you. Um, you can see how on the paper pattern here I've just cut completely all the way up to the seam line for the gores. So that it'll be super easy for me to mark that seam line like so. Oh, come on. Um, so those are all marked, um, so, and I think what I want to do to mark these pleats is kind of do the same thing, but I'm going to do it like one line at a time so that I can make sure that all this is like still lined up. Um, so yeah, I'm probably going to like cut this one off first and mark it on both pieces and then the next one and like so on and so forth. Alright, so we've got the front all marked. I know it's it's blue on blue, sorry, but hopefully you can see it. Here's the pleats that we're gonna do, and here's the hip gore, here's the bust. You can see I've marked the seam allowance, but then I've cut out here too to make it a little easier for myself. I've also clipped like two the little corners there on both sides, same for this one. Um so I'm going to overlay the image right here of the original illustration and you can see in this illustration um, that the kind of side facing oh gosh terminology you can see in the original illustration that this long side is sewn after the short side a little bit like the way that the lines are going so our first step here is going to be to sew this side of the, this is the center front, it's going to be to sew this side of the gore. And so we're going to do that by pressing this edge, laying it like on our bust piece here, and sewing it down. I'll show you all that in just a second. But anyway, so the plan of attack is we're going to sew that, then we're going to press this line all in one go. Fold it over to match this line here. And so we're going to sew like this side of the gore and this pleat all in one go. And it'll be the same uh, process for this one where we're going to sew this side first and then this one all in one go. And I am choosing to do those before I do this one just because I think the finishing of this gore might kind of like run into the pleats a little bit. So. I think this is going to be like the cleanest <laughs> way to do all this. Here we go. Okay, so you can see this now that it's all pinned. So I've just, whoop, I press that edge and then put it like right up to the marked edge. That's what it looks like on the back. So we're going to stitch like as close to this folded edge as we can through all the layers, like just a millimeter away. Okay, so we've done that. Go on ahead and sewed this down. Oh, so lovely. Um, so the next step, we're going to flip this over and you can see 
There's one longer seam allowance provided by the gore and the short one that was the front. What we're going to do now is just press this up like so, like really press with a <laughs> with an iron, and then so like a quarter inch away or five millimeters from the line we already made to secure that new pressed folded edge on the inside. I like to sew it from the outside because I feel like the needle side of my machine just stitches a little nicer, but you could absolutely do it. You could absolutely sew it from this side to see it a little easier. Um, the stitch will go down into what will become the pleat, um, or you could end it like right here, but either way, visually, it's gonna look like it's gonna go down into that pleat. Okay, so we've gone ahead and pressed under and sewn that. Here's what it looks like from the back. I did fold up the seam allowance of the like bottom point here. Um, it's a little bulky, so you might choose to leave it. You could like surge across that end if you don't care about it being super historical or anything. Um, but the next step here, I've gone ahead and pressed that edge and continued it down in one continuous line here. So you can see that's one edge of the pleat. Well, come on, focus. And that's the other edge. So we're going to kind of do the same way we sewed this. We're going to pin this down to the marking right there. And just bloop. And sew it all in one go, as close to the folded edge as we can. And then finish up the other side of the gore, same as we did for over here. So I'll show you what that looks like. Just a quick note um, on curves. So, because we're putting a straight edge onto a curved edge, if you start from here and just pin up, odds are it's going to look like this is too long and this is too short. So what I do is I, uh, I put a pin here first because this point is important that it matches up. And the second pin that I place is this one. So I've made sure that it matches at the seam line here. And then any extra fabric on this piece is going to get eased into this. So it's going to feel like you're kind of pinning more fabric and less fabric together. Um, and it's going to look like that on the back side as well. You can kind of, ooh, you can kind of see it rippling in there a little bit. Um, but that's partly because this is such a large seam allowance. We're going to like fold that back and stitch it down and that's going to help. The curve situation a little bit but yeah I just wanted to mention that because I think it's important and it's going to affect how this bust gore performs a little bit as well because you'll have a little more fabric in this curve versus if you had started here and just sewn straight up you'd have less fabric and it'd kind of be pulled like a little taut across the bust in a way that might not be the goal here so anyway I thought I'd mention that Let's go ahead and, you can see I've pinned it now, and sew this whole thing down. Okay, so we're back. We've sewn this seam, and we've also stitched down the other side. So it looks like that. Um, I was kind of torn on this about how to do that, because the original illustration didn't have anything over here, so you could like invisibly slip stitch down that edge if you wanted to, and if I was sewing by hand, that is exactly what I would do. Um, this dart, once it's sewn, is so narrow, <laughs> um, but you could, like, instead of stopping the seam at the point as I have here, you could run this line of stitching, like, down into that dart if you wanted to. I think that would be also an acceptable solution. So anyway, woohoo, we got one! Time to do the other one. Okay, I'm putting in the hip gore on the front piece here. The bust pieces are all done. And I just wanted to show you this real quick. So when I was pressing this edge under, I noticed that like to get right to the point, my pressed edge was rolling a little farther than what I had marked. So when I go to pin it to the gore here, I'm letting it sit outside the marked line of the seam allowance on the hip just to compensate for that. 
because if I try to mark up the current post edge with the line here, it's going to make like this area smaller than intended. Um, and also, I feel like this this kind of like curved U-E shape is very historical. <laughs> I see it a lot on early Victorian corsets and Regency ones as well. Um, it helps spread the stress a little bit more on a piece like this. So yeah, I just want to show you that. Okay, so I'm at this point on the second side and just wanted to show you something really quick. So I've sewn one side of the core end, but not the other side yet. And I found it helpful to, at this point, go ahead and press like the seam allowance from the side I've already sewn and the bottom before I attach the other side so that when you attach this other side, you don't have to worry about this edge and <laughs> trying to like fold it up as you go or something. And then once the other side's in, you can do this second line of top stitching like all in one go for the whole triangle. Much better. Okay, so at this point we've got gores put on the front one hip gore put on the back, same method as for the hip gore here in the front. And then the next thing we're going to do is this side seam. Um, and we're actually going to sew it the exact same way that we've been sewing these guys, where this seam allowance is smaller, we've pressed that edge under, and we're just going to lay it on there and pin it and top stitch it as close to the folded edge as we can get. Alright, so this is the back side of the assembled front back piece. Um, I've sewn this part of the side seam down so that it looks like that. And I just wanted to show you before I sew this second side down. Um, I've pressed like the edges of the gores uh, like uh, when I folded it under I've, I've used when I folded it under I put the folded edge like right up against the seam um, for this side seam though, I didn't go quite that far. I just made it so that like the cut edges would about touch each other because we're going to put a bone channel here and I wanted to make sure that when I stitch this edge down, it's still going to be wide enough for that seven millimeter whalebone to fit. So yes, we'll go ahead and stitch that down. Okay, so here's the inside. One whole complete assembled side. So exciting. The next step will be to cut and press and apply our little bone channel things here. Um, so I pre-marked this one. I'm sorry there so you can barely see that because I did them in chalk but you can see that one. This one pre-marked and then this little group that runs diagonally on the back. And then this one that runs kind of center between the bust scores I marked after this was all assembled because it's a giant mess and it overlaps a lot. And so I thought if I tried to mark it on each piece, it probably wouldn't line up. So I just kind of like laid the paper pattern for this middle bit on and like peeled sections of it back and marked it and then connected it all. So all that to say, um, it's okay if it's not like exact exact. Um, like when I make Edwardian corsets, a lot of times, and I think this is what they did too, <laughs> when you sew the bone channels on, it's like, oh, this edge, like, is a quarter inch away from that seam or whatever, and you make, like, as smooth a line as you can, and you might notice at the middle, like, oh, at the middle it's supposed to be kind of centered between the two points, or like a little bit to the left, or a little bit to the right, or whatever, and then at the top you'll be like, okay, it's supposed to be, like, exactly between the two gores. Like, as long as you kind of hit those landmarks and it's making like a smooth line from one edge to the other, that's all you really need. It shouldn't be making any like really strong curves um, to one side or the other when the channel is kind of like laid flat like this. It should be like a relatively straight line. It's okay for them to curve a little bit like that's an in an interesting like engineering kind of thing that corsetry can do like when you curve a channel what's going to happen when you put a straight bone in it is that it's going to like if you did curve it more this way it would like push more of the corset to the front of the body and vice versa so like there's some interesting things you can do with it that way but that's some just kind of general ground rules um, for this and as I mentioned earlier 
Um, what I'm gonna do for these is just measure like the width across, add seam allowance, cut straight green strips, and I'm gonna use a piece of cardstock in my iron to like press the edges under, and then we're gonna apply them. I haven't decided yet whether, maybe I'll show you both ways, um, whether I wanna stitch these on from the inside of the corset or if I want to get fancy and like baste them on <laughs> in the right place and then sew them from the outside of the corset so that the stitch quality is better. It's a very like perfectionist detail, um, but it might be important if you're using like that Japanese silk top stitching thread and there's not very much of it on the spool and you don't want to have to like wind a whole bobbin with it and play with the tension to get it looking sort of decent. So, yes, bone channels next. Here we go. Here we're just gonna show you the two different options for pressing those channel pieces. So the first one is a quilting bias tape maker and I use this a lot in the half inch width and the three quarter inch width. The pink one is the larger three quarter inch width but they're pretty easy. You just feed the fabric through and follow with the iron close behind. They make really nice straight lines. So easy. And then if you have the wider pieces, here I'm just using a postcard edge to provide the straight edge to press against. You just can move it down as you need. Um, I also like to use um, just like a wooden plank to help get a super crispy press after I've done both of these. You just, yep, <laughs> helps take all the steam out pretty quick. So I've done one side and I just wanted to show you what it looks like with all the bone channels sew in. This is from the right side. And here it is on the wrong side. So we've got these like single pieces that we've sewn four lines across, like so. Um, I've got my back facing here um, in preparation to do the next side. I've already pressed this edge under. And I've got my kind of block pieces here ready to go in order. So there's facing, the diagonal piece, and then these go in order like from back to front. We'll grab our other piece here. Um, I think in the directions we've said to do the channels first and then we'll move on to facings, but I realized it's kind of hard to see like one where the stitching lines should stop when you're sewing this diagonal piece in, but also like where the facing is going to end. I guess you could just like measure it and draw it, but for me that's like, ugh, I'm afraid that it won't be precise enough and that I'll probably like end up stretching fabric somewhere by accident or something. Um, so what I am going to do is sew this facing piece on on the edge first so that I can like press it over and at least see where the finished edge is gonna fall and then we can like pin and sew all these and I'll show you that too. Um, but yeah for now let's sew just the back facing on like so we'll follow this line it'll get turned and pressed and everything i did also want to mention too um the original instructions for this corset don't mention a waist tape at all um which is pretty common for these like softer corsets of the era however you could add a waist tape if you wanted to um and this is the point at which I would add it. Like before I'm gonna sew on any of the bone channels and before I've secured fully the facings. Um, so where I would put it, you can kind of see actually just by like pulling it and kind of like letting it drape that you could put a waist tape like right across here. Um, when I see waist tapes in like later factory made corsets, they always have a little slope like this, like a little gentle slope where they're lower in front, higher at the side, 
and then slope down again in the back just a tad. Sometimes they go straight across the back or they are even pretty high and like have an arc like this, but that's what I would recommend if you do want to put a waist tape in. Um, I would recommend like one inch silk satin ribbon. You could use tool tape, but tool tape's a little bulky, um, but something like that would work, like three quarter inch or one inch wide cotton tool tape, and you would just like baste it in right here. And then when you sew all the bone channels in and the facings, that'll be plenty to like hold it in place. So let's go ahead and sew this facing and I'll also show you the pressing of it because it's a little like tricky trick that I think is helpful. All right, so I'm gonna show you pressing this back seam. So here's our facing piece. We've got this edge already pressed, so we wanna be careful that we don't undo that work. Um, and all of the seam allowance, rather than like pressing it open, the giant one inch seam allowance, we're going to keep it all heading towards the facing at this time. Give it some nice steam. Like that. Um, and the reason we do the one inch seam allowance is just so the grommets will have a little more fabric to hold on to. Let that cool a little bit. And then you can flip it, of course it right side down here. Move the whole thing back and this is where we can make sure this edge is like nice and even. And go ahead and press this edge. Firmly. Now I just give it a little tug. Put my little wood plank down on it to make it a very sharp crease. The wood absorbs any steam really quickly as well as some of the heat. So it's a great trick if you need something ultra crispy. So yeah, there we have it. There's our back facing and now it's really easy to see where we need to make this little bone channel group end. So let's take this back to the cutting table and I'll show you how to mark and pin on this piece. All right, here's the piece just made. Center back is sewn now, but all this is still open. This is going to be this piece right here. Um, with anything more than like two bone channels next to each other, I like to go ahead and kind of like pre-mark. Um, so I know that I'm going to start with like a stitch line right down the side there. I've got some of the actual boning that I'm going to use. I can just kind of lay it on there. So I know that I'm going to need five lines of stitching to fit four bones. And I'm going to go ahead and like pre-mark these for myself just because it, I know it will help me kind of stay steady. even. So now you can lay this on here. It doesn't have to be like perfect. It just has to kind of be in the right area. And I'm just going to secure it with a couple big pins like this. Um, when I sew it, I'm going to sew like the middle stitch or as close to middle as you can get first and then work out. And yeah, as we get into this area, I'm going to mark right where the fabric piece overlaps. But that's not where I'm going to cut it because we need a little bit of seam allowance under too. So we're going to maybe mark another line just a little bit inside that. That's where we need to cut it. 
I'm just going to do that very quickly. So now we can go ahead and sew these lines. Um, and personally, I'm going to stop sewing the lines right where I marked that the folded edge is going to end because I know that way from the outside of the corset, the seam lines will all match up and be nice and I won't have it's like it's fine if you end up with these seam lines kind of running over the bone channels here like structurally but I think it just looks nicer if we can avoid that so let's go sew this this piece is sewn I've given it a quick steam to erase the pen marks this is what it looks like from this side here it is from the outside gone ahead and trimmed these up so beautiful um, okay so the next thing that I'm going to do is stitch down this back facing just while I'm here and then I'll continue on and do the rest of the bone channels. Um, I wanted to show you I've cut a piece of like medium weight linen and very heavily starched it. Um, I started doing this just to put in where the grommets go um, a while back because I find it really helps the whole like grommets wanting to pull out after a while thing. Um, even better if you have like gum arabic you can use or if you are in 18th century circles and you are buying like Taylor's buckram that's been stiffened with gum, it's kind of the same thing. Um, it's just something that I, that I have tried once and found really helpful uh, to like kind of stiffen this area without bulking it up too much, especially since we've already got bulk um, for these channels, we're just going to do one stitch as close as we can to this edge to kind of help like shore up the edge. And then we're going to stitch channels for two bones. I like to do this edge first, three-eighths in, then this edge, three-eighths in, and whatever space is left is what's going to be for the grommets. Um, for my grommet machine, personally, I like to set those grommets before I put the bones in. Your mileage may vary. I know um, some people like to do it where they put the grommets in after the bones because they feel like the grommets can kind of hold on to the bones if you're putting them like very close together. My machine uh, likes to cut holes in the fabric if I do that, so I'll not be doing that. But like I said, whatever floats your boat. So I'm going to go ahead and sew those lines now. All right, so we're back. This is all sewn down now where we've got two bone channels and space in the middle for grommets. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and put these guys on next. Same process. We've got our marked lines. Um, for marking this line, since it was kind of a, a bit of a mess with all the um, pleats and everything, the first thing I marked um, I took the piece that <laughs> that I had cut apart and you can match up this corner and this pleat, the line of the bone channel that I could see all the way down, I marked that first. And then since it was like a set width the whole way down, I just used the ruler to mark the other side where it goes over this front hip gore a little bit. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna follow that same process. I will say as you're going, as you're sewing these on, if you need a pre-mark bone channels like we did for this backspace, you totally can. As you're sewing these down, um, stretch the corset a little bit so that there's more length in the channel because when it's on the body, it's gonna be curving like this, right? for the majority of its shape. Um, so this curve will have to travel a little bit farther than the outside of the corset. So this will help it be super smooth when it's all on. Um, Cause if you are sewing, if you're stretching the channel instead, you'll probably get some wrinkling in the waist area 
on the outside, like on the corset fabric. Um, it's a very small detail and it's probably an amount of wrinkling that like if you're sewing with cotille or cotton twill or something like that, if you steam it, you might be able to just shrink it right out. Um, but something if you are really perfectionist and you want a super smooth corset is something that you can do. Um, so let's go ahead and sew in these remaining three channels and then we'll get to putting in the busk. Before we go on to the front facing, we have to mark and sew these little corded areas. Um, so what I'm going to do for that, it's just one more line up the middle of each channel. So I'm just going to lay it over and kind of peel it back and look at the height here. Like that. And then, you know, just sew another line straight up. Um, if you are hand sewing, you could put the cording in now and kind of like stab stitch between the two. I think that it will be easier for me to sew it first and then shove the cording down in there <laughs> since it's a pretty short length. Um, yeah. And I'm debating on whether or not to like sew this to, I think I will, I think I'll go ahead and like make a nice little curvy line and sew it with the machine and then sew right up the middle of each. So let's go do that. Before we do the front busk, I was just going to show you, um, trying to put the cord in <laughs> these little shorty channels was uh, really annoying. <laughs> so the... The fiber rush that I made, that I recommended at first, I think, is just too big. Even though I like the like amount of stiffness that it has, uh, for the size of these and for how thick the fabric that I'm using is, uh, it's just too big. If you're using like cotton sateen or something, you might actually be able to fit it in there. Um, so I went to this other paper cord that I have that's a little smaller, um, but it was still like. I was having problems with it past a certain length where it would just want to collapse and so I went ahead and like marked the top edge and cut that part off because we are going to cut it off eventually anyway and bind like down over it. Um, and I was able to shove some of this cording in here with these little needle nose jewelry pliers. I kind of like poked in at the beginning to like make a little starty channel and then just like put it down in there. I do think um, 1.5 millimeter like waxed cotton jewelry cord would be the best material for this. So I'll write that in the like recommended materials. Yes, because I think that would be that would do what we want it to do without it being so hard to get in there. But yeah, intriguing. <laughs> so we go ahead and do that on the other side and then I'll show you how to do the busk going to put the front busk in now. Here we have our completed wearer's right side of the corset. We're going to make this as if it were for a right-handed person. If you want to make it left-handed, all you have to do is turn your busk upside down and do this on the other side of the corset. Um, so first we're going to do the loop side. Um, and I'm going to work on the facing piece for this because the front piece of the corset itself is cut a little on the bias and I don't want it to stretch. Since the facing is cut on the straight grain, this will be a little more of a stable option. So um, it's going to go on like so, right? This is the wrong side of the fabric. We've marked the one inch seam allowance. We've pressed up what's going to be the far edge. Um, I like to use the one inch seam allowance just to give me extra fabric traveling over the top of the loops and to stitch down on the other side of the loops um, because I feel like it gives a little more time. Uh, this is one of the first areas to wear out on a corset from just friction from waistbands um, or if you wrap the strings around and tie them at the waist. 
Um, so just having an extra fabric layer really helps. Um, but what we're going to do, I'm going to put that aside for a minute. As I mentioned, I've marked the seam allowance. And I've also marked the top and bottom edges of the corset. So we're going to lay the busk on here and try to go just in between. Um, the first thing I'm noticing is that this busk is like a little long. So we're going <laughs> to... We're going to just center it. We're going to need to leave a little more room for a binding, so we're going to cheat it a little bit and not cut quite off. Not We're not going to... We are going to cut off not quite as much of the top and bottom edges eventually, but that's not what we're worried about right now. We're going to lay this busk along the one inch seam last that we marked. And just mark on each side of the loops. Like so. Set that aside for a minute. So that the next thing we're going to do is sew this facing on. And we're just going to sew down the front, skipping over those areas that we marked where the loops are going to poke through. So you can start and stop the stitching on each side of the loop if you want. Me, I like to maybe do a little bit of back tack, but then just kind of lift the foot up and continue on the other side um, so I don't cut the thread in between. You can do whatever you like. And then we're going to like press this to the inside, same that we did for the back facing. Here it is sewn on. Um, you can see this is a particularly narrow facing <laughs> that is really like just barely going to hold the busk. So I'm going to cut down my one inch seam allowance and on the final pattern for y'all, I will make it smaller. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and sew this facing onto this side and turn and press same as for this. We'll be right back. So we've got facing sewn on this side. It's still open. I've trimmed down the seam allowance so that it'll still fit inside there. Um, so what we're going to do is lay the loop side over, matching it up. And just mark through the loops for where the studs are going to go. Now that you can see where the studs are going to go. And of course we want the studs to be a little bit closer rather than if we do it upside down, they'll be too far away from the edge. So we want them on the closer side. We can use an awl to poke a hole through this top layer and let these guys through. Or you can even use like a little punch if you have a really dense fabric and the awl is like pulling the grain or twisting it in some weird way. And what that looks like. Um, you could do it just through the outer layer. You could, I suggest doing it through at least this seam allowance because that's the reason that we left it long. If we can get the seam allowance on top of the busk here, that's really going to help with the longevity of the corset.
just work it through like that one at a time and when we've got them all done you fold this facing edge over and baste right alongside just like we did here um, just so that you can I like to do the basting because then you can really like control this edge rather than sometimes it can like roll a little bit or twist if you haven't like secured it in some way so that's why we baste once it's in and basted then we can go over to the machine and put a zipper foot on and sew right next to the busk so let's hop to it Okay, so we're back from the machine. We've sewn right along the edge. It's close enough that it's caught the folded edge, um, so I'm not going to do another line of stitching. I'm thinking though that for the final pattern that y'all will see, I might add like a quarter inch to the facing so that you don't have to trim the one inch seam allowance and so that you have room to do like a second line of stitching here. If you need it it's also a great way to add another thin bone if you like need a little more support in this area um, on that note since this is the 1870s we're gonna bend the front busk a little bit um, the way I like to do this is just bending it with my hands um, and I'm only curving it from the waist down and the main reason that I am curving the busk is not to like produce that shape but to prevent the front from like dishing out like this when you wear it um, so when you curve it it'll at least have enough resistance to like be a straight line again um, and what I'm gonna do is just like use this hand to bend the busk and these fingers to like bend it on you can also use the edge of a table this is a pretty like flexi busk so it bends pretty easily but yeah there we go um i i don't like the modern spoon busks because i find them just so like heavy and stiff and for most of the corsets i make they're they're just way too heavy um and so if i want a spoon busk on a corset what i do instead is get a busk like this and i bend it and then if we really want the stitch line with like the extra spoony shape width at the bottom, I just cut out pieces of like template plastic and put them on top and it works great. It kind of keeps the same like stiffness in this whole area. I'm sure there are ways you could like put metal in there instead of the template plastic, but um, it works really well for me. It's, a, it's the sort of thing you can buy in like the quilting supply section because people will make little templates for their pieces out of this like kind of thick plastic um, but anyway that is done very exciting let's go next to the grommets or eyelets that we're going to do in the back edge here we are with the back the best way to mark the back for me has been laying this finished center back edge next to the pattern like so um, remember that I've trimmed a little bit of the top off enable uh, in order to get the cording in there we haven't trimmed the bottom yet so it should be down here this is a great time to mark that actually if you haven't and then to mark the eyelets I'm just gonna go straight across like this um, if you wanted to be even more precise you could take a little punch or an awl or something and like punch out the paper pattern holes and mark them through like lay it on top of your fabric and mark it through there for me like you can see I've I've gotten a couple that I didn't like and I'll just this is like the heat erasable pen so I'll just kind of cross them out I don't know <laughs> Yeah, 
There we go. Um, you can, again, use the awl to open up the holes before you put eyelets in if you want it to be a little more resistant to tearing out. Um, I use a I use a set of dies and grommets that are self-piercing, so they like cut and put the grommet in all at once. Um, so I don't know. I might try just to show you what it looks like to like open it up first. You might need to get like um, a sharpened dowel or a chopstick or something with like a smooth edge to enlarge the hole a bit, because I think this hole's probably a little small for the eyelets that I use. Um, and on that note, for the eyelets that I use, um, I like the double zero best. I think the X double zero, which is a little smaller, is a little more like historical size. Um, but it's up to you. I the double the X double zeros that are real small are like the right size, but I feel like they really hold the lacing in a way that I don't always love. Like I kind of want the lacing to be able to slip through a little easier. And that might be just like kind of a wearing preference too. So at least I can give you the information and you can make an informed decision on which you like better. But as you can see to mark the second side, I'm just laying them right next to each other. I have seen a wonderful trick where if you do the grommets or eyelets on one side first, you can then lay that side onto the side that doesn't have them yet and just mark through the eyelets. So that is also a great trick. All the eyelets set in. What I ended up doing was punching a very small hole and then opening it a little more with the chopstick and that felt like a good compromise and all the eyelets feel super solid now. On our directions the next step um, as listed in the original is to put all the bones in. I prefer to like bind one edge and then put bones in and then bind the other edge just because getting a corset wrangled under the machine um, with all the bones in it is kind of annoying. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I might jump a little bit back and forth. I'm just a chaotic sewer, <laughs> I guess. Um, I will say though, when you're making this style of corset, you have to watch a little bit for bones which don't go all the way from one edge to the other. So for example, we have these ones that go in the center back. I'll put them in right now. Um, if I had bound the bottom edge, they'd be totally closed off. So I need to put these in before I do the bottom edge binding. And then right next to them, we have the diagonal bone channel groups which are kind of the opposite. You can only access them from this top edge, so you gotta make sure you get these in here before you bind that edge. Um, if I remember right, the directions for this corset also have you do the flossing first um, before you go ahead and bind the edge, which is intriguing. I guess there's no reason you couldn't do that. I usually wait until it's all like bound and done to kind of see everything because I'm trying to like make everything even and I feel like if I bind it afterwards it might be kind of uneven. Um, but you can do you can do it either way. 
I'd certainly love to hear how it goes if you decide to put all the bones in and then floss it. So now we've got the bones in the back. I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and mark and trim and bind this bottom edge. So you can see that I've got the back marked. Um, if you want to be really precise, you can like lay the paper pattern pieces on and kind of see, you know, account for any shrinkage or any like edge shredding and like remark. I I just kind of eyeball it to be totally honest, especially if I have like, you know, a seam edge that I've like sewn a little bit unevenly or something. Um, you just kind of like even it out between them. Um, I will say you especially want to mark the top and bottom edges at center front and center back. Um, you can see right here where the edge of the busk is. You want at least a quarter inch past that um, to be able to sew that binding on. That's like the absolute minimum, so I might cheat that even a little bit more just so I'm not sewing right up against the busk, which can get exciting <laughs> if you're not careful. Yeah, I can go ahead and I can show you. So here we have it. Um, I'm going to trim this off now. If you are using like a bias tape binding or a straight grain strip of fabric to do the binding, like in my Pretty Housemaid corset, um, you can sew that on before you trim this. It just kind of depends what you want to do. I'm going to go ahead and trim this now. Now that that's all nice and trimmed, I'll take it over to the machine and show you how I do the Petersham binding in one step. We're going to wait to trim the top edge just so we can check all boning lengths and all of that stuff um, in case anything shifts. Alright, we've got our trimmed corset, Petersham ribbon, some little tweezers because they are helpful sometimes. Um, the way that I start these is by overlapping it just a little bit like this. We want it to be tightly wrapped around that center front edge. Fold it up so that there's maybe like a quarter inch of ribbon on the front of the corset and like three eighths of ribbon on the like body facing side of the corset. I have a knee lift presser foot which helps a lot <laughs> with this. That's how we started. And once that is started, we just the same small stitch length that I've used for the rest of the corset. I am stretching the Petersham a little bit as I go. I'm trying really hard to make sure that it's like right up against the cut edge. There's not any like gap. Um, be careful with the the bias pieces because they can stretch a lot. I'm trying to not ease or stretch them too much because I don't want it to just get stretched out. But 
And then when we get to the end here, I'm gonna stitch till it's mm, maybe like five eighths of an inch away. Do a little back tack and cut the thread. Gonna cut this. We don't need more than like three eighths of an inch or so. And then we're going to wrap this top layer around the corset the same way we did at the front. Hopefully I can show it to you. Like that. And then fold that side down. And then we can keep on sewing. And this is where the tweezers can be helpful. Like. If it's um, if it's poking out a little bit here, you can oh get out of there here. If it's folding out a little bit here, you can like use the tweezers to kind of pull it a little bit tighter. And voila. So we've got the bottom edge all bound. So pretty. It's time to start cutting some bones for the rest of the corset. So I'm going to show you on these little guys. I've gone ahead and marked and trimmed up the rest of this top edge so we know that's going to be the final edge. And then I know also that my binding is going to take up about that much. So I for sure don't want the bones to be any longer than that. But I just lay it like this. I use a little pencil. Um, when they're slanty like this, um, the small ones I think you can cut like just rounded ends, but the bigger they get, the more that like doesn't work as well. And so I prefer to actually cut them on an angle like this and just kind of like round the point as much as I can. So I feel like then the pressure is a little more spread out over this straight edge here. Um, but it's up to you. It might, um, it might depend to how you plan to floss this. Like if you are, if you really love like the teardrop shapes that we see a lot for this era of corset and in this area of the corset, like on this back with the diagonal bones, um, then you might cut it a little shorter here because you'll be stitching around the end of that bone and doing like the teardrop design like that. Um, our pattern didn't give us any flossing in this area, so in that case I would cut it on a slant like this just because I think it's going to last a little bit longer. But yeah, there are your options. We're going to go ahead and continue on cutting, smoothing all the bones for the rest of the corset. Um, for the synthetic whalebone, I just use a good old like emery board nail file um, to finish smoothing the ends after I cut them. For the rest um, of the bones, for the lengths you want to cut them, um, I like to leave maybe a quarter inch or so of extra room at the bottom and top edges. Um, I don't recommend cutting the bones the full length and just trusting that the binding is going to hold them um, because it's going to be kind of unnecessary tension in that case. And since we're doing this like antique corset, they for sure were not cutting them that long. <laughs> in some cases they're even like a full inch shorter and they're just there to kind of like hold the fabric taut. Like if you learned anything about corset making today, um, I would say take that with you that like it's the fabric that's doing the shaping the boning is just there to hold the fabric taut and keep it from like collapsing into a scrunchy waist belt so 
The way that you cut your boning and how long or short you choose to make it is totally up to you. But for this era, it is acceptable to do it quite a bit shorter if you need. But I like to do within like a quarter inch to three eighths inch shorter on each side. So yes, we're gonna go ahead and cut all the boning and put it in and then do the binding on the top. We have here two halves of the corset. I've done the flossing on one side so I can show you where it goes and how it looks and then on this side I will teach you how the stitch goes. So on this side um, I'm just doing these little V's which are for me the fastest and strongest like structural flossing. So we've got them on the ends of all of the vertical bones, bottom and top edges, like so. You can see the cording is like above that point. Um, these bones I didn't do any flossing on um, because they're so small, um, but also because the original instructions didn't say to do any flossing on these, so I'm leaving it off for now. And then I've also done the top edges of all of the bones. Um, and then from the back side, the inside, you can see that the way that I do the V stitches um, also travels on the inside of the channel and I do this to give as much support to the bone as possible and make it so that the fabric layers on both sides of the bone stay even rather than one fabric layer getting like pushed out because that's usually how the holes where the bones like wear a hole through the channel start. So that's how that looks. All right, we've zoomed in a little bit more so we can show you how to do this flossing. Um, this, of course, it's just one way to do it, but it's the way that I like to do it. So here we go. We've got a length of silk that's I don't know, maybe 20, 30 inches long. Um, I've tied a little quilting knot in one end. It's just single threaded through a nice embroidery needle. You definitely want a sharp needle that can pierce easily since you're going through so many heavy layers. Um, you want to work the bone in the channel to centered so that you have like about the same amount of space in the top of the channel that you do in the bottom of the channel. That's just my like personal preference, but that's what's going to make your corset last the longest. So we're going to start this from the inside going to the outside about one inch above where the bone ends, which I've hit with my fingernail right here. Like that. Um, and then we're going to poke the needle down a little bit past center. So like if this is the center of the bone, we want like maybe a millimeter or two past that. Cause these are, even though the visual effect is going to look like a V, it's going to overlap a little bit. So we've got that. The next point that we're going to come up is right across the channel from the first point that we came up at. like that, so that now on the inside it looks like that, and the outside it looks like that, so we're kind of making um, the same design on the in, on, uh, so we're making the same design on the outside and the inside. Um, next point that we're gonna poke down at is just past center on the other side, stab through all the layers like so. So hopefully you can see that it does overlap like a very small amount. That is the basic stitch. I'm going to repeat this so that we have three lines of thread on each side. Um, for the wider bones that are more like half an inch wide or wider, I actually do five rows of thread. Um, you can do more or less, it's up to you, but three has been like a nice number for me. So to repeat that, we're going to come up maybe like an eighth of an inch or two or three millimeters above where we started this, right there. And 
if you lay the thread down right next to that original one we made, you can kind of see where it needs to go. So you're going to stab down through all the layers like right next to that original stitch. Come up again about an eighth of an inch or two or three millimeters on the other side, like so. And stab down through all the layers, like so. So you can see, you just kind of keep going around. The reason I'm doing that is so that I get this like support stitch on the inside of the corset as well as the outside. Um, I like to have these like V's or the teardrop shape as my like structural flossing. Um, but if you want to add extra embroidery in the form of like little stars or flowers or like whatever else you may have, um, that stuff doesn't need to go all the way through the layers. You could kind of just embroider it onto the top layer. Um, sometimes for this last V, rather than coming up for the last stitch, as we have been doing, I'll instead just go right across like this and go up just so that my finishing knot can be like at the same level as my starting knot. I don't know if it really matters, but um, the reason I do that is because if I'm working on um, a group of bones where there's like three right next to each other and my thread is long enough, I'll just like do, I'll start on this side and that way when you finish this one you're in the perfect spot to just continue on to the next bone. Um, so that's how I do them like that. But now that we've got three of each, if they're separating a little bit like this you can kind of use your needle to like scoot them, <laughs> pack them a little closer if you need to. Um, don't worry about it too much though as long as they're holding the end of the bone. That's really all we need. Then we're going to turn it over to the other side. Um, and to make this final knot, all I do is take like a teeny tiny stitch that gets enough threads that I'm confident that it's not going to just like pull right out again. Like this. And wrap it around two or three times. And just pull through like so. And then you could clip it right there, but I like to bury the tail, so I'll stitch just kind of through the back layer of the channel here like that. And then trim it very close. So that way the tail's a little bit hidden and it won't be rubbing around. But yeah, that's how you do it. Now I just got to do the rest of the corset. <laughs>